In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, who hatest nothing that thou hast made, and dost forgive the sins of all them that are penitent, create and make in us new and contrite hearts, that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain of thee, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, welcome to our first session on Father Robert Krauss's Images of Pilgrimage. For those of you who don't know who Father Krauss was, uh, Father Krauss was a priest of the Diocese of Nova Scotia and the Anglican Church of Canada. He was a professor of classics at the, at the Classics Department of Dalhousie University for over 40 years, and he was a professor of uh, humanities at the uh, University of King's College in Nova Scotia for the same length of time. He was one of the first uh, directors of the foundation year program at King's. Uh, he was for some time the vice president of King's College and was instrumental in bringing uh, his friend and colleague Marian Fry as I believe the first female president of a university to King's College in 1987. Robert was born in 1930 in Winthrop, Massachusetts. Uh, when he was four years old, his mother died and his father moved the family back to Crousetown, where he lived on Crouse Road in his grandmother's house where his family had lived for about 200 years. He went to the uh, local schoolhouse, the one-room schoolhouse, until grade seven when he went to uh, King's College School in Windsor, which is now King's Edge Hill. Um, from there, he received junior matriculation at the end of grade 11 and went straight into King's without getting a high school leaving certificate. When he was 21, he graduated from the highest standing of the divinity program of his day, that is to say he had the highest uh, degree possible uh, because he had taken every class that was offered. Uh, but because he wasn't old enough to be ordained a deacon, he didn't bother applying for the degree. So he decamped to Harvard where he did a second degree in theology. From there he went to Trinity College in Toronto in 1957 where he did a Master of Sacred Theology degree under the direction of Eugene Fairweather, where he wrote a thesis on Augustine's understanding of justice. Uh, from there he went back to Harvard and began his doctoral studies under the supervision of George Hunston Williams uh, and uh, un with the assistance of a slightly older contemporary of his own, Giles Constable, who later taught at Princeton. Um, he went back to Dalhousie in, uh, well, he, for, before he went to Dalhousie, he went to Bishops, where he was for two years, and he taught philosophy there. Um, some of you may know Father John Whittle. Um, Father Whittle's vocation was discovered at, uh, at Bishops and largely under the influence of Father Krauss. Um, in 62, he went back to Halifax and started teaching in the Classics Department. Um, James Dowell, the great Canadian Hegelian philosopher, was then the, um, the chair of the Classics Department and hired Robert to come back to teach patristic and medieval philosophy. Um, and he stayed there for the rest of his career. Beginning in 1991, he was named visiting professor of the Institutum Patristicum Augustinianum in Rome. He was the first non-Roman Catholic to teach in that institution. And by the end of his time there, his course on Boethius and Ereugena was part of the curriculum. You couldn't get a degree in patristics from the Augustinianum without that course. So an impressive man in, in many ways. Um, while teaching in all of these universities, he was also very active as a priest, both in the Diocese of Nova Scotia, but in every, um, in every diocese in which he lived. Um, when he lived here in Toronto, uh, he celebrated uh, regularly at uh, 
the Sisters of the Church, the Sisters of St. John the Divine, St. Mary Magdalene's, and St. Clement's Riverdale. So um, we may as well just move into talking about Father Krause's text. These, uh, these addresses were given as retreat addresses to the diocesan clergy of Nova Scotia in 1986. There was uh, a priest of the diocese, Father Carl Tufts, who decided that it was important for the clergy to be going on retreat together. So he convinced Father Kraus to give a series of retreats at the Augustinian Monastery near Antigonish. And at the end of this retreat on images of pilgrimage, uh, they twisted Father Kraus's arm to publish his talks. Um, he almost never published these sorts of things. Um, in fact, I think um, they may have had to be typed out from a tape. Um, I think that, I'm not sure that he had full notes. I think he may have spoken uh, just, from, just from point form notes. Um, basically, I'm just going to go through the text. Um, we'll read a little bit and I'll comment a bit on it, but if people have questions or thoughts about any of it, um, we can also discuss that. Um, did people have the book in advance? I know that most of our people didn't have it, but uh, I guess the St. Olive's people have had it for about a week. Excellent. Um, yes, Father. Well, uh, just to say, if anybody is looking for a copy, please see me, and I've got extra copies, so. Thanks, Father. Um, w before I start talking about all of this, if anybody has any particular points that they want to have discussed, or any particular interests that arose that we should be um, keeping track of, feel free to, to tell me right off and we can, we can keep those in mind as we go. All right, we'll go, we'll go right into the text. The first thing that I want to talk a bit about is just um, what Father Krauss means by, now we only have about an hour, so um, this is going to go quite quickly. So feel free to slow me down and tell me, I don't understand what you just said, because it may not always be clear. I'll try to be as clear as I can. The question uh, I first want to look at is, what does Father Krauss mean by pilgrimage? So when we think about pilgrimage, what what does that conjure for us? Any idea? A very long physical walk, like something like the Camino uh, to St. James of Compostela, for example. Yeah, a, a long journey with a spiritual end, excellent. Um, examples of that could be the Camino in Western Europe, we sometimes might think about the Pilgrim Fathers, so-called, leaving the British Isles to find freedom of worship in the United States. Or we might think about John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, where the character Christian um, is an image of the whole Christian life being lived. And all of that is there in that, uh, in that image of pilgrimage. But there are three essential moments in any pilgrimage that we need to bear in mind if we want to understand uh, exactly what Father Krauss is talking about and why it is, for example, that we can talk about pilgrimage as an image of our redemption or image of the Trinity, even. So there are three essential moments of pilgrimage. The first is a going forth. Yes. Uh, please use the microphone so that people at home can. So the first moment is a going forth or a beginning. The second is the way. or the road. And the third 
is the arrival or the end of the pilgrimage. Every pilgrimage has those three moments, and we're going to see that in each of the images of pilgrimage that we look at, in each of the realities that are imaged by that image of pilgrimage, those three moments exist. So Father Krauss begins, the fundamental and all-encompassing theme of the spiritual life is pilgrimage. Its images are the images of wayfaring, of exile and repatriation, of alienation and reconciliation, images of journeying through wilderness to gain the promised land. The Bible abounds in images of that kind from the beginning to the end, from man's ancient exile from the paradise of Eden in the book of Genesis to the vision of the new Jerusalem in the book of Revelation. Indeed, the scriptures represent the whole of our existence, the whole of natural and spiritual life under images of pilgrimage. From the descent of all things from God in creation to their return to him in the final summing up of hell and heaven, the theme is all-inclusive and cosmic in its dimension. As St. Paul explains, the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now, awaiting the adoption, when the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Pilgrimage, pilgrimage to glory, pilgrimage to liberty, is the life of all creation and the meaning of all nature and human history all natural and human history. That's a bold claim that pilgrimage is the nature of all created reality. When we think about pilgrimage, we tend to think of a long journey <laughs> from here to there, having some sort of spiritual benefit perhaps. But the idea that that the structure of all reality is a structure of pilgrimage is a bold claim. But if we think about it, creation itself is a going forth, a beginning. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And it's appropriate, I think, that we're looking at this image in Lent because remember that in the ancient church, Genesis 1 is read on Septuagesima and it's preserved in our prayer book office lectionary that we begin on Septuagesima Sunday with Genesis 1 and John uh, 1. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning was the Word. And the way, that's the whole existence of creation in time and space. It's the traveling through time and space of, all, of being, of what exists for us to know. And in the end, it's a return. There's an arrival. Reality will cease to be in time and space. There will be an arrival at its end. Any thoughts about that? Does it strike people as surprising? <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
Well, and of course, uh, in some sense, for, for the scriptures, all of that is part of the way. It's not part of the arrival, right? So, um, and, we'll, and it will be important. So that's an important thing to point out, that not everything along the way will be pleasant or good. Yeah, you wanted to. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I just, I just w wanted to uh, expand a little bit on what this lady said, Father. That maybe what is actually going on with the abuse of the planet and so on is actually going a bit further. That they are trying to pr in, to bring about in an unnatural and and uh, pre premature way this end that you are talking about. That it's not, I mean, it probably would be a way, hopefully, because it doesn't succeed. But if, in fact, uh, it did succeed in, in annihilating everything, then it would be in the, the arrival happening when it was not supposed to at the wrong time. Right, but, but that, I mean, again, I suspect that what you're talking about is something like an end to human life on Earth or end to life on Earth or even end to the planet most catastrophically. But, but even that is still part of the way. <laughs> you know, if we cease to exist on Earth, there would still be being, right? There'd be the rest of the universe. We had a question behind. So, so I think that what I see is that every pilgrimage is a long, hard, often journey. Like, it's no easy piece of cake. That's but right. at the end of every journey, there's a new beginning to another pilgrimage. So when we get to heaven to be with God, It'll be a whole new thing. It won't be what we had here. It'll be another new pilgrimage. So at the end of every pilgrimage is a new pilgrimage. Well, certainly um, the ancients thought that. So um, remember, uh, and we'll get to this hopefully by the end of this class, remember um, Aeneas's journey in the Aeneid to the underworld and then his return. Um, and there's uh, also in Plato's Republic, there's the, the myth of Ur, where um, the character ends up in the underworld and then comes back. That sense of cyclical lives, cyclical pilgrimage uh, of that sort is a very kind of pagan thing. It, there certainly is a new beginning. You know, um, T.S. Eliot says, in my end is my beginning, <laughs> right? Um, which speaks of the identity uh, of the going forth and the arrival. And we'll talk more about that as we go through these uh, as well. Uh, Veronica, I think you had a... Hello. Uh, <laughs> sorry. So um, I was just hoping to keep my question with the going forth uh, section. Mm -hmm. um, that I was thinking about what you said about creation itself or creating as a going forth. And I wondered if you would apply that to creativity in humans as well, if we can think of like the beginning of a creative process as also a step of a going forth. Um, yeah, some, you know, some writers have sort of talked about writing as being sort of godlike or creative in this way, and I just wonder if, if, how you respond to that, yeah. Oh, I think uh, absolutely there is an analogy there, I think. Um, there's an analogy between the artist uh, or the fabricator's work bringing forth that which was not before um, from their own thinking. And that's very much an analogy of the creation of reality by God. It's a, it's a drawing into existence of something that wasn't there before. And I think we could see, you know, um, the beginning is the, the conception of the product in the mind of the artist. And the way, in that sense, would be the bringing forth of that for the senses. Um, and the end would be, I suppose, the performance or the completed performance when it had come into, you know, 
the sensible world and then been received by its audience, whether that's another audience or even just the artists themselves. Um, I think absolutely the analogy is right there. Yeah. Uh, there was another question here, yeah. So I was just thinking when you talk about pilgrimage, and as human beings, we tend to psychologically sort our lives into narratives of a beginning, middle, and end. And I suppose I'm just wondering, how do we differentiate from the narratives we impose, where we will shift events around in our memory to make it into something cohesive from our perspective? How do we distinguish that from a legitimate spiritual pilgrimage that I guess you could say, um, transcends us and has a greater meaning? Well, I think Father Krauss would say, um, implicitly through all of these, we submit ourselves to the images, to the trustworthy images, scripture, the tradition, um, both pagan and Christian, um, those images that others have create, well, not created so much, but that have come forth through others that others have thought on, commented on, um, so that there is something universal that's anchoring us, rather than us just kind of going through our lives and, and making everything about ourselves. Yeah. So, so that's the first thing um, that we need to remember, is that the whole creation, all of reality is pilgrimage. It has that shape of going forth, going through, and return. Um, St. Augustine says in the very opening paragraphs of his Confessions, um, he talks about creation, first of all, and then he says, and a portion of your creation wishes to praise you, or a certain portion of your creation, namely him right, or namely man, the human, the human wants to praise. Um, so we also need to remember that we're certain portions of that whole. <laughs> we are beings within that whole which is reality, all of reality. So creation. But then he moves on and points out that our redemption also has the same pattern of going forth, way, and return. So, can I have your, can I, oh yes, okay. I'm not used to this. So think first of the Incarnation. You have Christ, the Word of God, the Wisdom of God, who goes forth and takes on our human nature. You know, Annunciation, Christmas. He goes through his life his death and his resurrection. And then he returns in the ascension to the right hand of the Father. Think just of those wonderful hymns, for example, the Advent Office hymn, Verbum Supernum Prodiens, High Word of God who once did come, leaving thy Father and thy home, to succor by thy birth our kind, when towards thine advent time declined. And then the Corpus Christi hymn, Thomas Aquinas, the heavenly word proceeding forth, the Latin is the same there, yet leaving not his father's side. So two hymns with the same opening, one says, leaving thy father and thy home, the other one saying, yet leaving not. So he he both leaves the Father and remains with the Father. He remains God of God while taking on what we are. And the hodos, the road, is precisely his human birth, 
his life, his passion, death, resurrection, and the return, the epistrophe, in the Greek, the going back, um, is the ascension. Then we have the third person of the Holy Trinity, the Holy Spirit. John 14, 16, our Lord says, I will pray the Father and he will give you another comforter. And then in verse 26, the comforter who is the Holy Ghost whom the Father will send in my name. Send from where? From heaven. That is to say, from the divinity to humanity while leaving not the Father's side, right? Upon the church. So the sending, the going forth is the Father's sending of the Spirit into the life of the church and the unification of the diversity, not a destruction, but a, an ordering, a reunification, and then the return of the Holy Spirit with the whole church on earth into the back, back as it were, to the triune life. So in some sense, These are one reality. <laughs> they're, they're understood by us in image and thought as two different things. And there certainly is personal distinction within the Trinity. We're going to talk about that in a few moments. So there is, you know, the Spirit is not the Son and the Son is not the Spirit. But nevertheless, what we see as two things, the Incarnation, and the sending of the Holy Spirit are really one reality. It's, and it's the same reality really as creation itself. This is just what's happening for us who are this one portion of creation for whom the Son had to become human and the Holy Spirit was sent to draw us back in very particular ways. So creation, redemption, sanctification, those are three ways of talking about that. Three moments. But ultimately, the reason why all of this, creation, redemption, sanctification, has this form of pilgrimage of going forth, going on the way and return, is because that's really the whole life of God himself. The triune life is itself a going forth and a return. So the Trinity, in the Trinity, you have the three persons, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Father is nothing other than the going forth. He is the source of all divinity. And his going forth is the Son, which is to say, his knowledge of himself. So the Son is generated from the Father on the analogy of a concept in the human mind, only it's not simply a concept. <laughs> it's such a perfect knowledge that the Father and the Son can be said to be one substance. 
That is to say, there's nothing preventing the father from knowing himself. And his knowledge of himself is the son, which is nothing other than himself except by relation. And then the Holy Spirit is nothing other than the mutual love of father for son and son for father, whereby the two are bound in one in a going forth, which is the begetting, and in a return, which is the consummation of all Godhead in the Father, the source. Now, Trinitarian theology is notoriously difficult, so let's stop there for a moment. <laughs> and if you have questions about that, we'll stop for a moment and uh, see if we can get a bit more clarity. That's right. That's right. Not a force, no. So, so there's a question, of course, as to... For the, type, for the tape, I said, the Holy Spirit is a person, yes, and not a force? Correct. But, of course, the question is what we mean by person. Because what we don't mean by person is what we mean when we refer to one another as persons. So we refer to one another as persons on... This, this is a, a, a bit of a trick of history. We think today as moderns of the persons in the Trinity as being on the analogy of human persons, but the fact is that we call one another human persons because the church had this discussion about the personhood of the persons of the Trinity first. And so what, what we are is persons in the image of the Trinity. So we can be called persons precisely because um, we exist as, um, as subjects who, who remember, know, and understand. That is to say, we have a self-consciousness which can, as it were, descend into knowledge. It can go forth and act upon reality <laughs> and come to know it, um, and then can love what it knows. And that's what makes persons. But the church had to have the conversation about the Trinity first before we could realize that we were persons. You know, the, the ancient Greeks, for example, would not have thought of themselves as persons in the way that we think of ourselves. That's entirely a post-Christian concept. I got a lot of... Um, I'm thinking of a, an icon of, from Old Testament uh, Abraham and the, and the three visitors that came, to, pardon me? They were? The Rublev. Rublev, yeah. Three, th three, three persons coming to him, and then Abraham, I believe, does he not say, c call the three persons the Lord? He does, yes. But he doesn't call them persons. I think he calls them men. But again, the, I mean, and of course, you know, men and women are persons, but, but what it means to be a person is not something that had been thought through in the ancient world. This is something that, that comes through, I mean, it, it begins in the ancient world, like the reflection, Plato's reflection on uh, knowledge and Aristotle's reflection on knowledge. Um, is in a way the beginning of all of that. But the language of person um, 
really comes into the whole conversation through Trinitarian theology in the church. And it's uh, St. Augustine's analysis of the human person in relation to the Trinity, as image of the Trinity, it's through that that we, uh, in the Middle Ages, beginning in the Middle Ages, and then in the modern world, we begin to speak of human beings as persons. Yeah. So people didn't think of themselves as any entity on their own? They were just... Oh, no, yes of, yes, of course they did. Of course they did. But, but what I mean is that when we talk about, um, you know, when we talk about persons as, for example, essentially relational, you know, it's different to, it's different to call someone a person than to call them a human being. You know, the ancients knew that they were human. Right, and they would have known that they were individual humans. But for example, we talk a lot in the modern world about persons being essentially relational. That who I am as a person is a result of, you know, all of my experience and my relationship with other people and with my environment, all of that. That all comes about through this, or initially through this conversation about the relationality within the Trinity. And it's only when, you know, people start thinking of themselves as somehow images of this, created temporal images of this, that they begin to realize just how important, for example, human relationality is. You know, all of the things that we talk about, you know, Freud, for example, talking about how um, human children um, differentiate, you know, they begin with their mother and there's no differentiation uh, and eventually they have to begin differentiating themselves and they realize in some way that they're one person, their mother's another. All of that analysis, I mean, it's all there, right? We're, we're relational creatures, but to think of the human in that way um, as essentially relational, that's something that's quite late. Uh, Kenny, we have uh, just over here, Father. So I was just reflecting on the, the pattern you were talking about, about beginning and going forth, and then the way or the road, and then arrival and end, and especially in regards to the Holy Spirit and the Church and the beatific vision as the manifestation of that form or pattern, um, or, or image in this case, specifically for, for Krauss's book, he's using image, right? Mm -hmm. And I was wondering why, or how, how is this, how are the images universal? Um, if we're going specifically on Christian analogies, Christian images, um, how, are, how are those images not exclusive to the church? Um, so I suppose that that's maybe two questions. One is how, and the other is why are they different? Why are they not exclusive? Yeah, it just, it just seems like they're missing out on the way or the road of the Christian pilgrimage. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Um, I, I think I see what you mean. Um, in an absolute sense, yes, they are, but we need to get to the end of this chapter in order to see what it is they're missing. Um, they have a sense of a road. The problem is not that they don't have a road or a way. It, the problem is that the way is insufficient. Right? It, it doesn't get us to where we want to be. And we'll pick that up very soon. So we'll come back to this, no doubt, <laughs> as we move forward. But I just I wanted uh, just to underscore these things that uh, Father Krauss was saying, because they're they're things that I think are not uh, necessarily obvious to us uh, these days to see that that all of that. Um, is there in these images. So, 
if then, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that going forth from the Father to the Son is his self-knowledge, and his return, the return of the Son to the Father is effected through divine love. If we're images of God, that means that somehow this is also how we work, that we as consciousness go forth in investigating concepts, investigating images, investigating reality, so as to know it. And then we recognize what we know as somehow good, or more good or less good <laughs> than something else. And so, precisely as we're wrestling with these images, we are already somehow entering into this supernal pattern. Because if the Holy Scriptures of our tradition are divinely given, if they are, as our articles say, God's word written, that is to say, an articulation under the Spirit's influence of the Son, the Logos, the Word, then as we reflect upon them, enter into them, and learn to love them, we're already stepping into this pattern. Because every one of these images and every reality that's imaged by them primordially exists in the divine thinking. And these images are given to us as the appointed created means of entering into that thinking so that we can enter into that love. So that can radically reframe if we haven't thought that through before, it can radically reframe what we think we're doing when we're doing our Bible reading. It's no longer simply a matter of knowing the stories as an outsider, right? It's not just knowing that Noah was in the ark for so many days. It's not just knowing that Jesus was crucified, as important as that all is. It's an entering into the very reality itself. Because the images communicate the reality, and as we understand them, the un we understand the reality through the image, and learn to love the reality for what it is, we're entering into the divine self-knowledge and self-love. St. Thomas Aquinas refers to revelation um, as the means whereby we participate in the knowledge, in God's knowledge of himself, and the knowledge that the blessed, those who are already perfected in heaven, have of God. And in this life, we can't, by reason alone, understand those things, precisely because we still exist in time and space. So that's what we'll be about here this, this Lent. So that's the general introduction to the whole work, setting forth these, this pattern uh, and what the realities are principally that are signified by those uh, patterns, by those images. Yes. Uh, I, I can't actually hear you, so get the... Yeah. Are the persons of the Trinity, I mean, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are these the images of the Father? Is that... I don't understand what the word image means in this case. In this case. Well, 
Father, Son, and Spirit are images um, in the sense that they're, you know, they're words that have connotation. So when we hear the word Father, at least in the first instance, when it's referring to God, we probably think about our own father or some other father, um, and uh, and we may, you know, um, it doesn't mean <laughs> it doesn't mean that God the Father is like our actual father, our biological father, or our adoptive father. It means that something that we know about the relation of fatherhood um, is true of God. Um, it doesn't mean that God is everything that a human father is, because God is more than that, <laughs> um, infinitely more. But what it does mean is that the image is divinely, if it's given by the Son, right, who is the one who is begotten of the Father, who is in eternal relation, then he's telling us that there is something about fatherhood as we know it that is true of divine paternity. Um, Gregory of Nyssa, sorry, Gregory of Nazianzen, in his theological orations, is, reminds us not to think that the logic of images is from the bottom up, though. It doesn't mean that we're taking you know, everything we know about human fatherhood and elevating that to the level of the Godhead. Um, what it means is, although in the first instance, when we hear the word father in relation to God, we will probably begin by thinking, well, what could that possibly mean? What do I know about fatherhood? Well, what I know about fatherhood is what I know from fathers I see. Um, but it's always... Um, it's always a process of purgation of the images, right? Of beginning with something that we know concretely, but then thinking, what of that concreteness that we know here could be true in God? Um, so, for example, Gregory says, Every father that we know is also a son. But the father, God the father, is in no way a son. And this is one of the ways that he's distinct from. So, so when we say that what we know about paternity is what we know from human fathers, that's only true in the very first instance. But as we reflect upon other images of God and the Son's relation to the Father, that human image will be purged of the content that can't apply to God until eventually, you know, you have an image that perfectly, or more or less perfectly, um, communicates the reality of that relation. Male and female created he them. Yes. An image, particularly. Sorry, why is Noah himself not the ark? The ark is an image. Right. Why would Noah be an image? Well, I mean, the whole the whole story is an image. I mean, it's full of images. Um, Yeah, I mean, it, he, he, he is a type, um, potentially also, you know, an individual. But the, but the point is that when we're talking about images, I think we have to think about that fairly broadly. Um, because everything in Scripture points to something else. And there are relationships between images. You know, um, 
we don't simply look at one image and say, what can that image possibly mean in and of itself? We, we do that, but we also say, well, what must that image mean given all of these other images in the story? Or what can it mean given the fact that that same image, let's say water, is used in this story and this story and this story? Um, Bishop Callistos Ware said in one of his talks that I heard um, that reading the scriptures with a concordance <laughs> is a much better practice than reading with a commentary because with a concordance you can look up you know every instance of water in the whole of scripture or every instance of wood and you can read all of those things and say well you know in this point in scripture when simply taken in the context of this pericope this passage it can really only mean this thing but then it has all of these other resonances through the rest of scripture. So that, you know, wood in this passage in the Old Testament can also be a prefiguration of the wood of the cross, for example. Or it can be, you know, the wood of the ark, whatever. You know, the baptism of Christ, the water and the baptism of Christ evokes, you know, the, the waters of the flood and the waters of Meribah and so forth. Um, so all of these images relate to one another and, and we have to be you know, always looking at them in relation to one another, not just in their isolation. So for example, when Father Krauss says, um, he, he reads the first, uh, the first verse of Swing Low Sweet Chariot and he says, I looked over Jordan the pilgrim people stand at the border of the promised land, looking with eager, yearning eyes towards the place of liberty and peace, longing for the fullness of salvation. Behind them lies the bondage of Egypt, so what we've just read in Exodus up to that point, and the miracle of the Exodus. The 40 years of want, weary wandering, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, manna from the skies and water from the stony rock, fiery serpents to the scourge and the brazen serpent to the heel, uh, fiery serpents to scourge and the brazen serpent to heal. Laws and prophecies and fears and hopes, all that and so much more <laughs> lies behind these yearning eyes. So when we read, you know, of the people of Israel arriving at the Red Sea, <laughs> we have to remember all of the things that they have remembered because we've already read all of that. So we bring all of that with us. And then when somebody else writes about that image, we bring all of that imagery, all of that history with us. All right. With that imagery, we also bring our own imagery through our own history and what our parents went through and what our great-grandparents. So all of that imagery adds in with the Noah story and all those other stories so that by the time we read all of that, I would be at a different place to Betty, and we're all in a different place. That's right. No, that, that's right. And, of course, this is, uh, you know, the entering into that life of the, of the triune knowing and loving, um, that's our entering into it. Not, not our reading of ourselves into the images, but allowing ourselves to be informed by what we read so that we become part of the story and we're not just extrinsic to it. You know, part of the story of scripture, <laughs> broadly conceived, I think, is our transformation by those images. Right, because it will transform us, but that will also transform people around us, possibly by our conversations with them about the images, but possibly also just because we then become ourselves living images of this reality. I 
I can't quite read that clock. Do we have five minutes? Okay. Well, um, we could probably wind up this for tonight, but are there particular things that, is there any last minute particular thing that anybody wants to ask before we move on next week? You are. Who I am? Yeah. <laughs> I am but a humble servant of the all seeing providence. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm uh, Walter Hannum. Uh, I'm the, um, um, the vicar of St. Bartholomew's in Regent Park. Um, and I think I'm here tonight because I was a student of Father Krause's in Halifax and, uh, and in Boston. And um, yeah, and uh, I've been reading a lot of his works over, you know, more than 30 years. So, And you have a PhD in... What's that? You have a PhD in... Uh, I have a PhD in medieval theology. Um, I did a um, uh, what's called a critical edition of a Latin text, a 12th century Latin text with an introduction and commentary. And um, the author of the Latin text was the same author uh, on whom Father Krauss wrote his dissertation too. So, so I'm also part of that um, project. What's that? Yes, I like to think so. Oh yes, well, <laughs> I, my wife is reminding me that I was once a professor of Anglican studies and theology at uh, the College of Emmanuel and St. Chad in Saskatoon, and I think she'd probably also want me to mention that I'm uh, an adjunct professor at St. Augustine Seminary in uh, Scarborough. Well, if there's no final comments for this evening, thank you for this. This is a wonderful introduction. I'm sure I speak for everyone in saying uh, how much I've enjoyed this. Um, thank you. And uh, we do have a, a, just a practical question we need to um, ask you all, which is we have a conflict now with the last date. So as you probably know, we're meeting on Wednesdays all the way up. Well, originally it was planned to go all the way up into Holy Week, including the week of Holy Week. That's not going to work anymore. That last date is not going to work anymore. So w the question is, um, do we force Father Hannum to squish everything into five Wednesdays, so tonight and then four more Wednesdays? That's option A. Or option B would be to come back after Easter for that final session, maybe the week, Easter week or the week after that. So those are the two options. Wondering if you have a strong feeling about that. Would you like to sort of get this all finished before the end of Lent and then just move on to other things? Or are you, would you be interested in coming back for a final session after Easter, either the week of or the week after? How would, how would we squish? Starting earlier or going later? Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, maybe we would have to squeeze, there's six chapters in the book, so we would have to somehow squeeze two chapters into one session. Or, or something. You would just have to find some economy within to sort of put, you know, use one hour to do two cha two chapters. Yeah. Come after Easter. Yeah. What? Do, anybody have? Two chapters in one week, yeah. Yes. Okay. And so, anybody who's, that's, is that sort of resonating with people? Anybody strongly opposed to that? Okay. Um, and would it make sense to meet the week, the Easter week, or maybe wait for a week after that just to take a break after Easter? I know many of us are, are busy, so I don't know if we want to just take a breather. Pardon? Okay. How about you? Does that, do you have a strong feeling? Okay. All right. William, do you have a strong feeling about that? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, we can. Um, we'll, we'll let's just. We're going to meet after Easter, and we'll we'll make a final decision about which week it is. But uh, just keep that in mind. So we're not going to meet on Holy Week, the Wednesday of Holy Week. Okay. But we will be here next Wednesday. So I hope you all come back. 
And uh, I know we were joined by several people online as well, so thank you to those who are joining us online. And this will live on in YouTube uh, land for, for eternity. So um, hopefully it will be seen by many, many people over the coming weeks and months. So. <laughs> and uh, now we do hope you'll stay for about 10 minutes and we're going to do a service of Compline. If you didn't pick one up, there are some orders of service on that table and at the back. Does anybody need the Compline service? Let me grab a stack of them. to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord's name be praised. Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Thou hast set me at liberty when I was in trouble. Have mercy upon me and hearken unto Sons of men, how long will ye bless 
be to God. Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord, thou God of truth. I commend my spirit. Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Before the ending of the day, creator of the world, we pray that with thy wanted favor thou Wouldst be our God and keeper now. From all ill dreams defend our eyes, from nightly fear and fantasies. Tread underfoot our ghostly foe, that no pollution we may know. O Father, that we ask be done through Jesus Christ, thine only Son, who with the Holy Ghost and Thee doth live and reign eternally. Amen. Keep us as the apple of an eye. Hide us under the shadow of thy wings. Preserve us, O Lord, while waking. And God, us while sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. According to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. and to be the glory of thy people, Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Preserve us, O Lord, while waking, and guard us while sleeping that 
that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. I believe in God. The Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Blessed art thou, Lord God of our to be praised and glorified above all forever. Let us bless the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Let us praise Him and magnify Him forever. and glorified above all forever. The Almighty and most merciful Lord, guard us and give us his blessing. Amen. We confess to God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, through our own grievous fault. Wherefore, we pray God to have mercy upon us. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us all our sins, and deliver us from all evil. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and bring us to life everlasting. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the Almighty and merciful Lord grant unto you pardon and remission of all your sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit.
Thy spirit. 